off the ground. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, our sixth and final community liaison group meeting. We're going to talk about a lot about the policies today. So we've kind of completed our technical work and we're shifting into into policies. We've already started that in May, but now this is really a focus on, on policies. But before we kind of dive into um, the meat of it, I'm going to hand it over to, to Susan. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go through a few slides and then um, I'm going to be back with, with a bit of context, some background, and then Kyle will later on uh, go through the, the, the policy details. So just uh, bear with me. I'm going to share the screen here. Can you see that? Yep, that's great. Thanks, Martin. Um, so welcome everybody to our sixth and final meeting. Um, we have been meeting as a group since 2016, so it's exciting to be at this stage of the process. Um, I just wanted to remind folks that we've, we all have our cameras on today, um, and I would suggest we just um, mute while the presentations are going so that there's not a lot of other background noise and everybody can hear well. Um, with Zoom, we have the option to use the chat, so you're welcome to, to use that. There's a little speech bubble at the bottom of the screen if you haven't used it before and you can send a note in there um, if you've got questions as we go along and uh, we'll have those uh, in a queue for the for our discussion portion a little bit later. Um, if technology is in our favor, uh, participants will be able to observe via YouTube tonight similar to last, last time on the Source Water Protection website um, so that this is live streamed and part of the public record. Um, so when you speak uh, into, you know, your microphone or turn your webcam on, um, you, are, you are being recorded. So just so everybody's clear on that. Next one. So tonight we wanted to, first of all, say thank you for working with us through this process over the last couple of years. This is our sixth and final community liaison group meeting. Um, as usual, we'll provide a refresh on the study process, the scope and the key participants. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time um, providing an overview of the draft policy uh, text and receive feedback and have some discussion around that and then address any questions that you have about the process overall. Um, Amitai is gonna share in the chat for those of you um, who want to take a look at the policy language itself. He's going to set, share the agenda package from the Source Protection Committee meeting. Um, within the package, the, the draft policies start on, I think it's page 27 of, of 42. So if anybody's taking a look at that, um, that's where you should be looking. Thanks, Amitai. So hopefully people can see that in, in the chat. It is on the Source Protection um, website as well. Okay, just a recap, we are moving into the policy development phase. So we have been in sort of the study phase prior to this. Um, just a recap of the project team's role. So the project team is to lead the tier three water budget and they were responsible for all decisions related to the project. And I'm just gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves now. So Martin, I'll start with you. Yes, thank you, Susan. So Martin Keller, I'm the Source Protection Program Manager and kind of lead of the Source Protection Program in the Lake Erie region. Thank you. And Sonia? And you have to unmute. There you go. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm busy texting here. Um, I'm Sonia Stranat. I'm a Senior Hydrogeologist with GRCA. Great. And Kyle? Uh, yes, I'm uh, Kyle Davis. I'm the Risk Management Official for the Municipalities in Wellington County, Wellington Source Water Protection. And Catherine? I'm Catherine Baker. I'm with Source Protection Programs Branch at the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Great, and Sarah? I'm Sarah Wilhelm. I'm the Manager of Policy Planning with the County of Wellington. Okay, great. Um, in the policy phase, there will be municipal chapter leads. So the municipal chapter leads are responsible for policy development and draft, drafting the policy text, and they will have input input from the project team. Um, there's also the Lake Erie Source Protection Committee 
and they're responsible for an update to the Grand River Source Protection Plan, and they're leading the engagement and public consultation aspects. And then next is uh, the community liaison group. So that's you. Um, so your job has been to, to provide a forum for the community, the community to be involved, to provide input, and to abide by our terms of reference and code of conduct. So I'm just gonna ask each of you to introduce yourselves as well. Um, Chris, so I'm, I'm gonna go alphabetical. So Chris, we'll start with you. And you just have to- That's right, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris Neville. I, I'm a hydrogeologist and I'm here on behalf of Andre Ansemard, who um, is still on maternity leave, but just about ready to come back to work. Okay, thanks, Chris. And I think I saw Dave. Yes. Uh, Dave Blacklock with uh, Wellington Water Watchers. Great, welcome, Dave. And Don? Don, you want to unmute? Uh, Don Valerie, I own uh, Highland Pines Campground and Pine Meadows Retirement Community. Great, and Jan? Jan Beveridge, I'm with the Saber Water Group. And Jeremy? I'm a land development planner and I'm working on behalf of uh, Granite Homes on the Haylock Farm property in Elora, which is now called South River. I'm okay. a kind of project manager on that project. Uh, Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Welton. I'm uh, a member of uh, Save Our Water and uh, I guess a long-term member or a participant in the group here. Thanks, and Tom? Uh, hi, I'm Tom Nuds, and I'm uh, the uh, one of the unaligned uh, members of the CLG. Great, thank you. I think I got I think I got everybody who's here tonight. Um, the other the third party facilitator, so that's my uh, my role. So I'm Susan Hall, and I'm with Lura. Uh, so our job is to chair the meetings and provide facilitation and secretariat services. And I'm here with Amitai. Amitai, do you want to say hi? Hi everyone. I'm Amitai Zand, and I'm a community engagement coordinator with Lura. Thanks, Amitai. Okay, and then the general public has had an opportunity to stay informed about the Tier 3 study, um, provide input to this Tier 3 study via the public representatives and, and organizations, and then have been invited to observe our CLG meetings. So our agenda tonight, um, so we've done our, our 6.30 welcome and introductions. Um, we'll move into the overview of the draft policies and process. Uh, in a moment, and um, that will be led by Martin and Kyle. Uh, I will ask people to just stay on mute for that, but again, I encourage you to use the chat. So if there's questions or, or comments as we go, please feel free to type them in. And then when we get to our 7.30 discussion timeframe, we'll be able to circle back to some of those. We'd like to get your feedback and questions on, on the draft water policies that we'll be sharing with you tonight. Um, our goal is to be at next steps around 8.15 and closing remarks and to be uh, adjourned by 8.30. So with that, I'll pass it to Martin. Thanks, Susan. So next few slides, I'm going to provide you a little bit of just some background, some context where we've come from. You've seen that slide before, so uh, it won't be new to you. Um, so you can see here, We've obviously done a lot of technical work, the actual tier three water budget and the actual risk assessment. We've done some additional work that we've presented in May uh, with the threats analysis and the climate change assessment. And um, we now have moved into policy development. So we're really taking all the insights and the understanding, the, the, the knowledge that we've gained through the, the, those studies into looking at how we can address the significant risk level that has been identified for this area. Um, so we're at uh, yeah, policy development level. Uh, we've developed those policy approaches first. Draft policies are now uh, have been presented to the committee uh, June 25, and now uh, they're being presented to you uh, for input. Um, so the next one here, again, um, 
And we've been showing this timeline for you earlier. Uh, we've kind of enhanced it a little bit just to kind of show the process. Um, so we've condensed the four years of, of technical work in the, in, the, in the first column. You can see there 2016 to 2020, there's a lot of work that's gone into that and it's kind of condensed into that one slot. Uh, but that leaves us a little more room to kind of explain to you the, the next steps. Um, so in May, we've had the policy approaches. We've gone to the committee with some draft policies now. And now we're here uh, with the draft policies in front of the community liaison group. Um, as we mentioned, this is the final uh, community liaison group meeting, but the process is not really stopping and it is continuing. And we're now, and that's why we're going to have this kind of a reference to the Section 34 Grand River Source Protection Plan update. It's kind of moving into a different realm. Um, it's under regulation that we have to go through various steps before the plan gets be, can be updated and then submitted to the ministry and approved uh, later on. So those are the next steps. We're going to get into a little more detail about those. Um, so next one specifically is in October. Uh, we're going to go to the committee with revised policies. We have to do pre-consultation. So we're really going to municipalities and ministries. They can have the comments prior to going to public consultation. It's going to be in early 2021. Um, and in each of those steps, there's um, revisions, possible changes, tweaks uh, to the policies until at the very end, sometime in probably April, May, uh, maybe even early June, probably, we're going to submit it to the province for their approval. Um, so most of that, I've just, uh, just what's here on the slide I already talked about. So it's the final community liaison group meeting today. Uh, it's kind of, sort of closes the chapter of, the, of this group, but the process is still continuing. And as members of the public and, or stakeholders, uh, there's obviously still opportunities to have input. Uh, so the Section 34 Source Protection Plan update is basically just a more formal way for us that, that we need to go through a process that we have to go through whenever there's new information. And in this case, it's the Tier 3 study that has brought new technical information uh, to the foreground and obviously in response to the, the policies as well. And as I mentioned, those things can change as we move uh, and move along still. So there's not, no way... Uh, yeah, there's, there's no no closure on, on, on providing comments. Um, and here's some more detail about how those next steps kind of unfold. Um, so we're going to go to the October 1 Source Protection Committee meeting. Um, we're going to provide revised comments to them. They've seen the, the draft one in, in June. Um, with them, uh, we will also provide the comments that you're providing to us and the meeting summary. So they'll have the context that you provide us. Uh, so it's an opportunity for you really to provide input to the Consortium Protection Committee on, on those policies. Um, we're going to add it later on. To, uh, we're going to repeat ourselves, so to remind ourselves in terms of some of the timelines. But right now, I'm just going to mention that um, for, for the information to get to the October 1 committee meeting, we have to bring it out uh, in, in an agenda package earlier. So we'd like to, you to provide your comments within two weeks of today, September 16. Uh, if we receive it after September 23, it's gonna, uh, we won't be able to include it for the committee meeting. Um, your actual comments, um, they'll be addressed as part of pre-consultation. So we'll have to fall of, the, of this year to look at the comments and make any policy revisions. And they'll be then coming forward in January to the committee prior to uh, the public meetings or the public consultations. We'll have to decide that what, what, the, what the, the world will look like then and what we can do. Um, and as I mentioned, there will be further opportunities for comment and for input as part of the public consultation. And that will happen after the January committee meeting and goes into early March. So there's certainly more opportunities for feedback um, and um, changes to, to what we present today. And here we go, some background. Um, you've seen that slide before. Um, just to kind of remind ourselves what we're talking about, we have a well protection area quantity and we have a significant risk level. And the map kind of gives us the context. The policies will apply within 
uh, those areas. Carl will go into a little more detail about the, the whole of the county and, and where things apply. Uh, but in this case, that's what we're that's what we're starting off with. And the well of protection area quantity really, really is a is a conservative screening area that represents the area that may be affected by either current existing or future water takings from both municipal as well as non-municipal wells. So that's what we're, we're kind of starting off with. Um, I'm going to provide a very quick snapshot on some of the results that came out of the uh, technical studies. And really it's just to kind of bring us back into the mindset of we've done a whole lot of technical work. There's a lot of information that we now have to kind of translate and that we did translate into what did it mean in terms of those policies. So a lot of that information is important for us to kind of keep in mind and it kind of serves us uh, as, a, as, a, as a reason for why we did certain things and why we didn't do, do other things in terms of the actual policies. Um, so here's some of the information around uh, the threats analysis results. Where did we have um, influence? So where, where's the, where's the, the risk um, coming from? What is driving the risk? Increased municipal pumping to meet future population growth is really the largest kind of influence on, on the groundwater levels. Um, unserviced domestic water well pumping, existing unserved, unserviced domestic water well pumping, future land development, existing permitted non-municipal takings, and existing livestock watering have minimal impact. Now, with increased or new large groundwater takings, they do, uh, they may affect uh, groundwater levels at municipal wells, depending on locations, depending on pumping rate. So that's something that we need to, to um, address in, in policies. But this is important to kind of keep in mind in terms of what's driving the risk and where we may not need to focus as much. Um, so in summary, and that's also a slide that we showed last time, the implications for policy development, really taking that, those insights forward in terms of where we need to focus on in terms of policy development, a lot of the focus is on water management, municipal water management. So that includes uh, optimizing, optimizing uh, the water takings at the municipal level, it's water conservation, it's demand management, uh, in terms of the actual uh, decreasing the future demand, but also obviously on the other side, increasing the supply side of things. So optimizing what we have, or what the municipality has, and in installing new wells, finding new supplies. Um, in response to that, um, non-municipal water takings may be able to, uh, may, may influence uh, municipal levels. Uh, the second bullet is really about assessing potential interference with municipal wells, so those need to be studied, those need to be looked at when new takings are proposed. Um, maintaining recharge to support existing water budgets. It's not just that, but also water quality and ecological functions. So it makes for good planning to make sure that those, uh, those uh, that recharge is maintained, even though there may be not um, uh, large influences on the municipal levels, water levels at the municipal wells. Uh, to be able to move forward and, and um, later on Kyle will talk about adaptive management, meaning we have to kind of monitor, we have to find, uh, we have to monitor, uh, make sure we can collect data as we move forward. To do that, we need to maintain the models, the tools that we have, and for that we need to have funding, so there's policies to address that. Um, and I just talked about the monitoring both on the groundwater, the surface water side, interactions between them, good information, improving the information as we, as we go forward. Uh, means we can improve on the models, improve on the understanding as we move forward, and that will also then increase the information that we have to, to adapt and modify, uh, revise the policies uh, as we go forward. Um, in terms of uh, climate change, the one bullet to kind of just summarize what we found there, um, with the information that we have and the 2050 time horizon, the assessment that we've done, um, there's no climate change risk predicted to, to the quantity of the municipal groundwater supply uh, from that study. So it's not something that we need to uh, focus on right now. And with that, I'm going to um, stop my share and I think I'm going to hand it over to Kyle. Okay, great. Thanks, Martin. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Okay, 
Hopefully everybody can see that uh, okay and can hear me fine. All right. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time today to, to join us. Uh, my section of this presentation is about the water quantity policies overview uh, for the Wellington County chapter. Uh, and I'm going to take you through, um, I'm going to do a little bit of recap from the last meeting where I'm going to take you through uh, some of the approaches and what the threats are, what we're writing the policies about. And then I will uh, dive into the policies themselves and give you a, a summary of, uh, of what uh, policies uh, we've written. And of course, uh, Amitai had uh, provided the link to the, the document. If you would like to, uh, to follow along or, or have that open for the discussion, that would, that would be great uh, of the actual policy text. All right, so uh, we've, it's been four years, hard, hard to believe. Um, the technical work um, has been, uh, been going on that long. Um, we are now into the next steps, which is to write the policies based on the technical work. So a bit of a recap under the Clean Water Act. There are uh, two water quantity policies, uh, sorry, two water quantity threats, uh, prescribed drinking water threats. Uh, that are possible. One, uh, the numbers there are just the numbers that show up in the regulation, but uh, number 19 uh, is consumptive water taking. So water taking is being taken out of the aquifer uh, and not being returned to the aquifer. And the number 20 is activities that reduce groundwater recharge. So think uh, creation of impervious surfaces, uh, parking lots, pavement, buildings, things like that. So policies, um, policies for these prescribed uh, threat activities apply within the WPQ. Uh, which uh, Martin showed you, and I'm going to have got another uh, map in the next slide just to, to show you again. Uh, and these will apply in, in uh, approved WIPA queues that are part of the Ground River Source Protection Plan or that are going to become part of the Ground River Source Protection Plan. And they apply to existing and future water taking, so that's threat 19, and they apply to only to future activities that reduce groundwater recharge. So, um, and that, that is where the significant risk level is significant. Uh, within a WPQ, which is what we have, the situation we have here in Center Wellington. So in terms of policy development, Susan uh, touched a bit on this, the Source Protection Committee delegated policy development to the uh, project team, uh, including uh, municipal chapter leads. And you might be asking yourself why municipal chapter leads? It's a watershed-based plan. Well, the Grand River Source Protection Plan is unique in the province in that uh, given the, the size of it and the population density, um, that there's actually different policies uh, and different in, in different municipal chapters. So for instance, pertaining to this, there's a Wellington County chapter, uh, which will contain the policies and what we're talking, and that's what we're talking about today for the majority of the WPQ. But there is actually a sliver of the center Wellington WPQ that goes into the township of Woolwich, and those policies will actually be found in the regional Waterloo chapter. And the next steps, as we've talked about, is the project team will re recommend draft policies to the Source Protection Committee. And the version that we're talking about, uh, talking about right now was presented to the committee in draft on June 25th. So the regional Waterloo policies uh, have actually yet to be presented to the committee. They'll be presented to the committee at the October meeting, the October 1st meeting, same as the, uh, uh, along with the, the new revised, uh, the revised draft Wellington County policies. So we looked at this map last, last time, um, but I, I, I like to put it up again. Uh, so there are four WOPA queues in the county, and these are these purple areas that you see on this map. So we are of course talking, and I believe you can see my, my uh, mouse there, but we are of course talking predominantly about Center Wellington's WOPA queue here, which is in Center Wellington, uh, but also stretches into Mapleton. And although it's blocked off, it does stretch a little bit into Woolwich, like I just mentioned. That WIPA queue currently is draft and has a significant uh, threat level. This WIPA queue here for uh, Guelph Guelph Aramosa system is also a draft uh, and it also has a significant uh, risk level. And then there's these ones that aren't hatched in Erin coming from Acton and Georgetown and they're both approved. So there's four WIPA queues uh, within, within the county. At this time, the, pol the focus on policy development though is for the Center Wellington WIPA queue and the Acton WIPA queue. So that includes portions of Center Wellington, Mapleton, and Erin. So majority of the WIPA queues for Acton and, and, all, and all of it for Georgetown is already covered by the Credit Valley um, Source Protection Plan, and that's what this watershed boundary is. But there's this tiny little sliver right there that um, these policies that we're writing in the Grand River will, will apply to. The Guelph Guelph Aramosa WIPA queue, uh, it's draft and that's a separate project and, and, and that's not the focus of our, of our discussion or the policy development uh, at this time. 
just a zoom in, uh, close up view of the Centre of Wellington. So the major, as I mentioned, the majority of this WOPQ will be covered by the Wellington County chapters. Uh, it is predominantly in Centre of Wellington itself, covers entirely Laura and Fergus, uh, as well as stretching into Mapleton and uh, covering entirely covering uh, Alma. And then there is the small portion that extends into Woolwich uh, that will be covered by the regional Waterloo chapter. And just to be clear, the, the Wellington County chapters, there'll be one set of policies, the Wellington County chapter, there's one set of policies and it applies to both Mapleton and Centre Wellington and Erin for the Acton portion. All right, so policy toolbox. So what policies are we allowed to use? Um, and the Clean Water Act uh, prescribes that along with, with its regulations. So one of the, uh, one, one of the important uh, things to note is that, is that if there are provincial regulatory approvals or uh, land use planning that could be used to, um, to, to deal with the risk, then there is direction to, to use those first. Um, and that's why they say show up on top of your top of your list. So French regulatory approvals, prescribed instruments are things like permits to take water. They could also be environmental compliance approvals for the recharge reduction that's uh, under sewage works. Uh, could also be Aggregate Resource Act um, approvals, uh, ARA licenses and approvals. Land use planning, of course, uh, is uh, various tools under the official plans or zoning bylaws, um, and also under design standards and things, things of that nature too. Education outreach and incentive programs uh, is a widespread tool that, that gets used and we will, we will definitely talk about kind of where we've, uh, where we've focused our efforts on that. Then stewardship programs, best management practice, pilot programs and research, and then specify action, the, the next two bullets, uh, are kind of a broad category of different tools that we can use for, for, different, uh, for, for different things. And we've, we've got a number of, uh, of uh, policies that we've written that kind of fall into these categories information sharing between agencies, municipal optimization um, of the municipal system and, uh, and a number of others. And then lastly, but not least, the Clean Water Act actually gives local municipalities um, the ability to write policies using uh, special uh, tools under the Clean Water Act, part four, uh, that allow you to prohibit and uh, prohibit activities and or um, require risk management plan powers, risk management plans. Um, so these are available. However, the direction we get from, from the, the province in terms of applying these powers is that we're really not supposed to be uh, using them un unless the tools noted above are not available or are insufficient to address the uh, significant drinking water threat. So a good example of where we have used risk management plan uh, powers or these part four powers uh, is with salt management. So salt management, um, although land use planning, education, stewardship uh, definitely are good tools to, to address uh, winter maintenance activities and, and road salt, um, they're, they're, they don't fully address, address the threat in terms of uh, potential impact of municipal drinking water. So in that case, we do have policies that have some limited area prohibitions around salt storage, and then also um, with certain conditions, risk management plan, plan requirements. Um, so that, that's, a, that, that's a lens that we have to look at when we were, when we were deciding, uh, the toolbox, uh, deciding which tools to use. And that brings me nicely into policy considerations. So when we sat down to write our policies, uh, along with the other members of the, of the project team, along with other uh, staff members in the townships and the county uh, that weren't able to join us tonight, um, Sarah and I, uh, kind of the primary authors of, of what we're gonna to present to you today, we had a number of, of uh, considerations that we had to, had to keep uh, in mind. Right off the bat, and first and foremost, was the technical results. Uh, which is why Martin just reviewed re reviewed them again for for us all. Um, we needed to we, we need to keep in mind the key findings and insights to guide the policies uh, because the Clean Water Act is uh, first and foremost uh, supposed to be a science driven uh, a science driven process. The other uh, another, the next consideration uh, as we were just talking on the other slide is uh, that existing regulations or existing uh, legal instruments are preferred where possible. Uh, and it's important uh, because we're trying not to, we're trying to avoid duplication of regulatory burden. And, and, and that's really where an applicant or a landowner or a property owner is required to do 
similar or the same things by one or more uh, regulatory, regulatory body, whether that's the provincial ministry of environment, whether that's the township, whether that's the county or the conservation authority. So we really have to look, look through um, in, a, in that lens when we're writing these policies. And then direction is pretty clear about prohibition as, as a last resort. Uh, and we've, we've got that, um, we're gonna, uh, we'll talk a bit more about that in, in a few more slides, uh, but there is a fairly uh, a clear direction from, from the ministry uh, in the province on uh, kind of when and where prohibition can be used. We then look, um, because the county, uh, and you saw that map which showed all the different uh, whooping cues and you saw the watershed boundaries, well each of those watershed boundaries has a different source protection plan because that's how the Clean Water Act has been set up. Um, Justice O'Connor's uh, recommendation was to set it up on watershed boundaries. So that poses an interesting challenge for us in the county because we have six watersheds <laughs> in, in the in the county, um, and that ends uh, that ends us. Uh, that means that we actually have five source protection plans. There's two that are that are merged. So we did look at approved source protection plans both within the county and also um, neighboring in other in other municipalities or outside of uh, outside of the county to see what policy approaches were used um, for whoop queues because this isn't the first whoop queue uh, policy exercise in the province. There's I could be wrong on the exact number, but there's about half a dozen, I believe. Uh, CTC, which is the credit, uh, and Halton Hamilton, which are both within the county, have WPQ policies, as well as a number of other uh, places. We also then looked, although the technical work can drive it and it can then uh, result in, in slightly different policy approaches, we still kind of overall look at the precedent of approaches that are used, uh, used in those um, in those approved source protection plans and also within our own Wellington County chapter. Uh, there is a kind of general theme or, or uh, uh, a way that we've, we've written policies um, and I've, I've kind of I've been talking a bit about that already in terms of the prohibition where we use prohibition in, in a limited fashion. So the consistency with other uh, plans doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be exactly the same. Uh, it can be kind of consistency in intent um, and it can be you know yeah, and it, or it could be exactly, it could be word for word, but often it means more consistency and intent and just uh, similar, uh, similar objectives being reached. And then there's a large policy, so there's a large policy suite um, that we're going to walk through and they're kind of broadly in three themes. And the idea when we were putting this together, and it's one of the things we we're considering, uh, is an adaptive management approach, which I'll, I'll introduce in, I think, about two slides in a bit more detail. And the whole idea was to integrate the municipal and provincial water management tools um, as much as we can within the WOPQ. Um, so this is things like the permits to take water. This is like the, the water supply master plan, the class environmental ass assessments. And we're really working to, uh, with those policy uh, and the land use planning uh, approaches as well. And really with this, pol with this uh, policy suite, we're trying to integrate uh, those tools. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Okay, so to the policies themselves. Uh, so if you, if you wanna follow along with policies, uh, absolutely have them, uh, pull them, pull them up uh, on, your own, on your screen or have them printed out. I'm going to talk broadly about the policies and themes, and then when we get into discussion, we can absolutely get to specific policies and why we why we wrote things certain ways and and why we put commas where we did. <laughs> so, all right. So there are major themes in our draft policies for the water quantity, and they can be grouped into three into three themes. So management through existing provincial prescribed instruments. Uh, so this is permits to water, aggregate resource act approvals, etc. The next theme would be growth and development or land use planning. And so you will see a number of land use planning tools, um, some of them legally binding, some of them, uh, so some of them uh, consider, uh, but there's a number of land use uh, planning tools for both threats. And then thirdly, there's municipal water management. And I'll be honest, um, I kind of just use that term as a catch-all because there's a, a lot of different, uh, you'll see there's a lot of different types of policies that are kind of on that slide. Um, so this includes things like optimization of the municipal system, which is a big, big driver um, uh, and a big policy goal. Uh, education outreach and a, and a few other and a few others. So the policies within the themes and between the themes are all designed to work in tandem with each other. 
in an adaptive management framework. And this was what we had in mind as we were uh, drafting these policies and as we look to implement these policies, hopefully within the next year or so. So an adaptive management cycle, um, adaptive management is used in, in a number of different industries. Um, I, I think I first heard about it in resource management back in university, but it's a, a feedback cycle where data is collected, management tools are evaluated and adapted, adapted and then modified based on results and the cycle starts again. So really you could look at we're at the start of that cycle. We have collected a whole bunch of data, we've evaluated uh, or we've, uh, we've evaluated the management tools, we are now about to implement those man, uh, management, management tools and then we'll continue to review them and then adapt and modify them uh, going forward. So one thing to take away from this is that, and Martin was talking about it in the section 34, which I know bureaucratic term, but what it really, what I think the takeaway message is, is that the Clean Water Act and source protection uh, planning is not a static process. It is a feedback loop. So that section 34 is just that bureaucratic mechanism for us to make those changes and adapt and, and, and ch change. So, we sp so sp specifically with water quantity, we were very intentional about writing our policies and working and putting them together and uh, interacting with our, uh, having the policies interact in this adaptive management so they feed into each other. But overall, the source protection uh, program is actually set up in this uh, model as well. All right, so the first theme, permits to take water. Uh, so this is the prescribed instruments. Uh, so this is permits to take water, ARA, which is Aggregate Resource Act approvals, and environmental compliance approvals under the Ontario Water Resources Act. So as we've mentioned in considerations, management through existing provincial instruments is preferred. Uh, so we knew that going in. Um, and that being said, uh, there, there's also technical justification for that as, as well. Um, some of the technical work, as Martin uh, uh, pointed out, greater than 50,000 liters, which happens to be the threshold, not coincidentally, happens to be a threshold where you require permit to take water, greater than 50,000 liters, uh, take, groundwater takings greater than that threshold, were the major drivers of the risk. Uh, and actually, the municipal system is the major driver of the risk. Um, so really, it made sense to write a number of policies about managing through existing provincial instruments. It also helps to achieve the goal of not duplicating regulatory processes. So the policies which are in front of you uh, provide directions to ministries and terms and conditions for those, for those approvals. These are legally binding policies. This is the only time when we're writing policies that we can actually tell the ministry they need to do something. Now, all the, all the other policies with the ministries are, we're asking them to consider. Um, and and with, the provincial, with provincial instruments, we are still asking them to consider. We still have to, it's important to have, give the ministry staff discretion to do their jobs, but they, they do have to uh, look at and review whether existing provincial instruments or when they're issuing new ones uh, within this area. And to build on that, uh, we actually added some additional policies, not just the straight up policies on PTDW and ARAs and environmental compliance approvals, but also additional policies to strengthen the relationship and collaboration between municipalities and ministries. So you may have noticed a policy there in the land use planning section that talks about municipalities in the land use process uh, reaching out and talking with the ministry um, to try to, uh, and, and this does happen, but this is kind of trying to formalize it. And we actually have a mechanism uh, suggested to, to formalize that even more. Uh, similarly, there's policies around um, around the water supply master plan uh, process and class environmental assessments when we're looking for new municipal wells, same thing, kind of strengthen that collaboration and, and discussion between ministries and municipalities. We also are hopeful and, uh, and uh, optimistic the proposed provincial water quantity management framework, uh, which many of you will have seen and, uh, and commented on back this summer. Um, really, I think, in my opinion, will help support the implementation of these proposed policies. Uh, there's there's a number of different. Uh, it's it's still at the early stages, obviously. Uh, the the document, the framework document, is uh, is a, a high level document at this point, but really the direction the ministry is signaling to go does fit very nicely with with the overall approach that we've uh, we've identified here. So I've talked a lot about permits to take water, and that's and that's sort of natural. We're talking about uh, about poly, about water taking, but um, the environmental compliance approvals. You may be wondering what that is. And that's really addressed to the recharge reduction threat. 
Uh, and there are, uh, I think it's A and B under threat 20 in the policy document um, about that. And that's really for um, management of uh, groundwater on site often uh, that there, that the develop, developer uh, and the applicant is, is attempting to achieve a water balance or to, uh, to, to not just move the water off site into a surface water body. So uh, that's where, and, and those are designed and, and um, designed and reviewed through the uh, planning process. However, they are also approved ultimately by the ministry through the environmental compliance approval process. And that's, and that's what's there. Great. So moving on to growth and development. Uh, so this is uh, growth and development, land use planning predominantly. So there are a number, a number of different policies. You'll notice a couple different policies there. I've, I've mentioned, I've touched on a couple where they interact with the provincial uh, process. Uh, so the, here's another one that I haven't talked about yet what that does interact with the provincial process, which is the growth forecasting. So um, looking at uh, earlier, stronger contemplation of water supply considerations in provincial growth forecasting and municipal development planning. Um, and there's a policy specifically directed to the county uh, in terms of in terms of um, looking at this uh, during the uh, allocation of growth. Then we also have planning policies written for uh, change that will ultimately result uh, result in changes to the official plan um, for new developments maintaining existing groundwater recharge rates. Um, so that would be again addressing the future development, uh, but but dealing with the existing groundwater recharge rate. Um, and then increased study requirements in the official plan for new developments taking greater than 50,000 liters per day. So that is the threshold for currents to take water. Uh, and as we mentioned before, the technical work, that was one of the main drivers of the risk in the Center Wellington Work Acute. So we've talked, I've talked about this, about the next bullet, which is increased coordination uh, between municipalities and the province. And that's an important one for sure, because uh, there are two parallel processes that really do feed into each other. And, and there's work that's, uh, that's done in both processes that, uh, that, that um, are uh, is similar and not that it's duplication is done for different purposes but it's definitely shared between the two processes and then uh, to support kind of the, the four bullets above uh, there are the needs there is some, there was we did determine there was some need to, to propose some changes to definitions and report requirements to strengthen um, the existing county of official plan requirements so some of the definitions that you see uh, in there uh, so like for the drinking water threat disclosure report in particular, that's an existing county OP requirement, um, but we felt that there's maybe some clarity needed there that would help applicants and help staff um, just kind of better implement the policy. And uh, similarly, we've identified where we think that report and also hydrogeological reports would be required to support a planning application. So the last theme, which I promised is the catch all, is municipal water management. Just because it's the catch-all though, there's some very critical policies in here. Um, if you recall, I said that municipal water takings, we are the, we are the biggest uh, uh, risk to the, uh, to, the, to the groundwater. We're the biggest impact to the, uh, to the, in, the, in the modeling to the future groundwater levels in terms of municipal takings. So therefore we need to do our part, which, is, uh, which we're already doing but uh, there's always room for improvement and that's the municipal optimization strategy. So there's a policy directed specifically to the Township of Centre Wellington as the water provider um, to look at municipal optimization strategies and also to strengthen that link, uh, which again already exists, but it's always good to, to strengthen it uh, between the tier three study results and the use of the model uh, into the, uh, env into the environmental uh, class of environmental assessments, including the new ones that are coming uh, down the pipe with uh, the proposed new well locations from the water supply master plan. So this is really, um, some of this is building on the links that already were uh, in existence and happened through the water supply master planning process and the, and the tier three study, um, and then looking uh, into the future on uh, how best to optimize the municipal system so that we're using water efficiently and effectively. Um, and although we do need new wells and new, uh, and, and some new water sources that we're, we're doing our part too to make sure that we've minimized things like water loss and, and things like that. Next, is, tie, is, uh, it ties into that, um, and that's uh, municipal water conservation programs. So again, uh, there's existing programs. Uh, this has been identified in the Water Supply Master Plan. So really the tier three's uh, role in this is just to kind of support and reinforce the need for that. And, uh, and strengthen where possible. Uh, so municipal water conservation uh, programs we see also as, uh, as an important municipal water management uh, tool going forward. 
We then get into the next two bullets that are very key in the adaptive management process. Uh, and this is monitoring and information sharing. And we've talked about information sharing already, um, but bullet, I'm gonna skip to bullet four, but really we're proposing a more formal process for information sharing between the local water managers, which is the municipalities, the province, and of course the conservation authorities. Um, and the, the, the idea behind this is really to have uh, you know, regular opportunities, um, whether it's regular meetings, Zoom meetings, or just sharing of information um, to increase inf uh, information sharing on various applications, whether that's coming through on the land use planning side, whether that's coming through on the permit to take water side. Um, it could be existing, uh, it could be information on existing uh, uses where uh, permits are being renewed, for instance. Uh, and it could also be information that we collect ourselves uh, on the municipal system, because we, of course, are also subject to the Permit to Save Water um, program and, and also apply for Permit to Save Water and Safe Drinking Water Act license and drinking water permits uh, renewals. Uh, and I actually should point out that the Permit to Save Water policy is actually also directed at drinking water works permits, which is the municipal, uh, one of the municipal requirements for, um, for the, uh, maintaining a municipal drinking water system. So the incre uh, increasing information sharing um, is key for the adaptive management process. So that's the information that we already maybe have or are being provided by, um, that we already have or are being provided by applicants. But also what's important is you don't know what you don't measure. So it's increasing and maintaining groundwater and surface water monitoring to support the future updates to the tier three models and to support water management overall in the area, whether that's class EAs, water supply master plans or, or what have you. So those are key, uh, key uh, tools, in my opinion, uh, for the adaptive management uh, cycle, because that's where we're going to feed more information in, and we're going to review and evaluate the information, and then look for opportunities, or if there's things that, that aren't maybe working as well as we envision them, because that happens <laughs> for sure, um, and then look for, for tweaks. We then get into the last three bullets in the slide. Um, and we have put some uh, put, put it, bullet in here for continued provincial funding. Um, I'm not sure how successful we will be on that, but it's uh, it, it doesn't hurt to ask. You don't you don't get what you don't ask for. And in this particular case, um, these studies we've been very grateful to the province for funding these studies for the last four years. Uh, so we're we're looking looking forward into an update cycle, maybe five, maybe ten years. It's hard to say but would there be the possibility of provincial funding for tier three model maintenance, climate change assessments and, and uh, things like that. Then updates to municipal design standards. So this is, support, this is a, it could really have gone under the growth and development as well, but it's really uh, to support, it's really to support um, the, the planning and especially on the recharge side in terms of what the engineering standards uh, need to be uh, for, um, for uh, for instituting low impact development and recharge reduction measures. In a lot of cases, this is already there, uh, but it's a matter of kind of going over it again with the source protection lens and seeing if there's anything, uh, anything to add. And last but not least is education and outreach. And it is important. Uh, sometimes it just gets the short, short, uh, uh, short end of the, of the stick, but it is very important because all of the threats that are less than 50,000 liters for water taking. So that's a lot of your private well, domestic wells. Uh, or exempted, um, are not addressed through the policies that we've, we've been talking about. And they're addressed through education outreach, and they're, they're addressed to a certain degree through the water conservation program as well. Um, so we are required to have kind of policies that will, uh, that will cover all of the different variations of significant threats, and that includes the ones that the technical work says don't really warrant the more regulatory approach. So we've pulled out a softer tool. So if you think about that toolbox slide again, it kind of goes, uh, we've, we've got kind of the more regulatory uh, or the stick where we can pull out a, uh, a more of a stick uh, tools, the more regulatory tools, down to kind of the more softer uh, collaborative tools. And we've really tried to use a combination of all of those. Uh, to, to kind of move forward. And with the, with the work that the, the takings that were identified as kind of not contributing significantly to the, uh, to the uh, risk level, then the softer tool will make, make a lot of sense, which is the education and outreach. An example of that, just to put a plug in, is the wellingtonwater.ca uh, website. And we already actually have some basic water quantity uh, uh, information up there already uh, to support some of the work we've been doing in the CTC. And we certainly look forward to having more up there and possibly on social media cha channels too.
Okay, there's a question that I'm sure some of you are asking, and I want just to address it head on. So why are there no part four prohibitions? Why are there no part four, part four risk management plans? Why didn't we use those new tools that, were, that are in the Clean Water Act? So Ontario Regulation 287.07, section 24, and I'm trying not to, I, I've been trying not to give you too many sections of the acts, but this is an important one. Uh, it is, it refers to source protection committee and it's an obligation that the source protection committee must look at all other options before considering prohibition. So prohibition is a tool of last resort and that's black and white in the regulation. So then we look at kind of, okay, where, so that's fine, we know that. Where have we used prohibition previously? Um, especially within the Wellington County chapter plan. And the answer to that is we've generally limited prohibition to about 100 meters around, around the municipal wells. And that's for water quality policies. So that's the, there are things like, you know, no, no storage of bulk fuel within 100 meters of the well, uh, new, new storage. Um, it's maybe large quantities of salt. Don't, don't store that within, within 100 meters uh, of the well. And those are activities that often have a volume threshold that in large volumes can very clearly cause an immediate impact or an immediate risk to the municipal well. So there's usually, usually not a lot of concern with kind of prohibiting things like that uh, and within a small area. For water quantity though, limiting a pro prohibition for water takings within 100 meters of the well would really have a negligible effect on protecting this supply. You could just have a, another uh, well, another straw in the, in the drink, so to speak, at 105 meters uh, from the well. And whether it's 105 meters or 100 meters, it, it's still gonna have the same effect. So why are you even prohibiting in that 100 meter zone? So really then you look at, would you prohibit for the whole of the queue? And then, then this is where we get back to the first bullets, prohibition of the tool of last resort and precedent, we typically don't prohibit in, in large areas around, around the well. On top of that is that the hydrogeological complexity and the model uncertainties, so tier three model uncertainties, actually provide kind of limited support for prohibiting water takings in a large area, like i.e. in the whole Wilbur Q. And what, is, what does that mean? Um, so we were talking about this today, and, and what that kind of means is I kind of uh, put it akin to the weather forecast. So we all understand that the weather forecast is, is regional, and our, our tier three model is regional. And the weather forecast will tell you that if there's a chance or even a likelihood of precipitation of, of rain in Aurora and Fergus and Center Wellington. But it won't tell you exactly when that rain is going to fall at your house, or exactly how much rain you're going to get at your house at that specific location. And that's a way to think about the tier three model as well. It gives you kind of, it, it's, it's, it's very good for what it's built for. It's fit for purpose and for the regional area. Um, so it'll give you good predictions for the regional area, but, it, it, but for site specific, it would need more work and more, uh, more, uh, more data added to it to really be able to kind of drill down and give you the answer that, that you need. So in that case then, prohibiting, it, the model doesn't really support kind of a wide scale prohibition. And then the other, other side of it too, is that the water quantity framework, um, again, we're optimistic with, with what the province has proposed. It has priority of use, which includes municipal use in, in, uh, in, in one of the highest priorities. It has increased municipal participation, whether that's host municipality support for, for water bottle, bottling, or more broadly, uh, and I would argue uh, th um, that this is going to be a very, very important, the area-based water management, where you're looking at cumulative effects of all the different water takings, municipal, um, golf courses, industries, um, across, across an area. Um, so we feel that that's, that tool, um, or that those proposed framework is going to help uh, also, and, and also supports why we're not looking at, at prohibitions. Um, also, there's a leak, some legal principles where if we prohibit too broadly, we can actually open ourselves up to challenge. So it's actually a little more defensible to restrict it, to restrict use, uh, rather than just outright prohibit something. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I've got a couple more slides. I'm just going to move, move through. So then we move on to risk management plans. So 
Why did we not use risk management plans? Well, it comes back to the technical work. The largest driver of the risk were water takers greater than 50,000 liters. And these takings, as we've discussed, are subject to permits to take water. So to add a risk management plan requirement to that is duplication of regulatory burden. We then, the second bullet, we've talked lots about this already, so I won't go into too much detail. Really though, how it applies to this is we've also then, on top of that, added some additional policies to strengthen that relationship between the municipality and the, and the province to kind of support the permit to take water process and make the permit to take water process more robust than it already is. It's already a robust process, but to make it even more robust. For aggregate operations, we uh, have targeted the, the use of approvals under the Aggregate Resources Act, um, uh, as well as in conjunction with the permit to take water where, where those uh, pits and quarries need a permit to take water. And then, of course, there's policies directed at us in the municipalities. Um, so there's no RMP needed there uh, because these are policies directed straight at the municipalities and we will be held, account at, uh, held to account by the Search Protection Committee on whether we did or didn't uh, use them, which is the Municipal System Optimization and Water Conservation. So then we move into the water takings specifically that are less than 50,000 liters. Um, so really, again, the technical work showed that the takings, whether that's the, whether that's takings that are less than 50,000 liters, like private domestic wells, or whether that is uh, takings that are subject to an exemption, uh, which is actually livestock watering uh, and some domestic uses, they, they don't drive the risk of the municipal system. So again, no risk management plan needed in that, in that, in that scenario. Um, and on top of that, for future water takings, we've added, uh, similar to the policies to strengthen the relationship between ministry and municipality, we've added uh, land use planning policies and, and quite a number of them to kind of provide an extra layer of, of protection. Um, and this is in, in particular because the Tier 3 modeling did show that a future non-municipal taking, depending on its location, depending on how much water it uh, takes, could pose a risk to the municipal system. So, with, and so then we move, so we've talked a lot about water taking, we then move to recharge reduction. Well, overall, the technical results, recharge reduction was not considered a large driver of the risk to the municipal system. So right off the bat with that, the, adding another kind of regulatory, um, a regulatory uh, level, um, we didn't feel was necessary, especially when you look at the, the fourth bullet there that kind of outlines what's available for recharge reduction already. Environmental compliance approvals, land use planning policies, monitoring education and municipal design standards. So we felt that those were all sufficient to address the recharge reduction risk. So our conclusion at this time is that, and, and it's at this time, is that water taking and recharge reduction threats can be addressed through policy uh, approaches and policy text other than part four. The adaptive management process will allow us to reassess when the new information becomes available. We have that put in place um, with the working group or will be put in place. And then the section 34 update process and source protection overall framework allows us for regular updates of the source protection plan to ensure that policies are relevant and working. And a great example of that is this is actually our section with second section 34 within a year. We just finished public consultation and are waiting on ministry approval on the salt management uh, policies for water quality and the new well health protection areas for Center Wellington and Guelph Hermosa. So, so within a year, we're doing a second section 34 update. So, and overall, I think it's important to note, uh, and I mentioned this briefly before, that the section 34 process is part of the larger Clean Water Act framework. So although we've embedded adaptive management in our policies for threats, water for the water quantity threats, it's actually already embedded in the Clean Water Act. Um, so that includes an annual reporting process where we do have to, uh, to report annually through the Source Protection Authority to the Ministry, and we are questioned and asked uh, if we're not making adequate progress on, on certain uh, policies or, or certain targets. Uh, so that process also allows uh, an opportunity to review and, uh, and look at any of these policy approaches to see whether or not they need to be updated in the future. Um, and then just finally, um, going forward and in, in to touch on the process that we're in right now that Martin was talking about. So the draft policy text we're about to talk about, uh, the ABCD, uh, can change and is already changing a bit um, through uh, the feedback that we received tonight, the feedback that we're going to receive from councils when we go to councils in the next uh, month or two. Uh, we have a legal review ongoing, Ministry of Environment comments have been, have been provided. So you will notice differences if you compare the June 25th uh, policies and the policy we're talking about today um, to the policies that will eventually go to the Source Protection Committee on October 1st. And then of course it can also change again after public consultation in the winter. So I thank you for listening. Um, I hope that was helpful and I'm looking forward to your feedback and having a good discussion about this. Uh, thank you very much and I'll uh, 
end the presentation now and my screen sharing and let uh, Martin uh, take, take it back. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kyle and Martin for the presentation. I sent a note in the chat. So YouTube Live is now on. Um, we will upload the full recording tomorrow morning. So it, it did start sort of partway through Kyle's presentation, but the full version will be available for everyone in the morning. Um, so I thought what we could do is just open it up for questions. Are there any questions about what Kyle or Martin presented? And we're not a big group, so I thought we'll try just with uh, unmuting. If you've got a question, just unmute yourself and feel free to, to ask. Hi, it's Don Valerie. The um, yeah. question on uh, uh, employment lands. Um, if part of the municipality is uh, designated as employment lands already, um, I'm sure there's been some gas at the kind of water use and sewage use and stuff that would be on those lands. Um, is there a need to go back through this whole process? And there's, there's two types. One is um, uh, industrial park itself uh, in Fergus. And the other is, uh, and it's a serviced um, property. And the other is an unserviced one that would be on uh, wells and septic systems. I don't know who can answer that. But. Um, I can I can start and then Martin or, or Sarah or somebody else can jump in if, if need be. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Don. So certainly, uh, so there's the two threats. There's water taking and recharge reduction. So in terms, of, I'm going to deal with recharge reduction actually first. So that is uh, was looked at in the uh, in the tier three model modeling work in terms of based on the official plan, uh, and that was actually how we came up with the conclusion that recharge reduction. Uh, kind of was a min minimally dry, drove the risk to the municipal systems because what we basically did in a computer model is say, okay, if all of that employment land is built up and actually not just employment land, all of like the, re the new residential land, that's all built up, you know, and that's all, and there's percentages of, of impervious surface and, and the amount of recharge that's reduced that's, that those assumptions are made. What does that look like? So, so that, was, that was assessed. Um, in terms of water takings, uh, especially within within the municipal service system, so the tier three is connected to the water supply master plan, and then the water supply master plan they certainly look at the the water uh, the water takings that are needed in the future to service um, you know it's a service growth, um, so that that is built into this as well. In terms of um, in terms of privately serviced water takings. Uh, so you specifically talked about the lands in Salem, um, industrial and commercial. So it would depend on what it is. And that's, I think, where we get to the policy part of um, that a, a, a new or future large uh, groundwater taking, non-municipal groundwater taking, depending on the location and depending on how much water, could impact the municipal system. So that's, that's really where the permit to take water policies and the planning policies that we wrote uh, to complement the permanent water policies kind of come into, come into play to really address that specific risk uh, that you're talking about there with a, a privately serviced industrial uh, parcel or commercial par parcel. Um, it, would, it would definitely depend on how much water it's, uh, water it's proposed to, be to take and that's where the planning proce uh, process policies and the permanent water process would attempt to get that information so that, it, that the proper decision can be made. Yeah, they, I, I agree with that. It's just a, I look at it from a, a business perspective. Um, somebody comes in and there's some industrial land and uh, I'm Mr. Joe Blow wants to build a factory and I want to build it. I can buy the land and I want to build it tomorrow because the demand for my product is there. I, I just want to, whatever we can do to help that happen. I, I know with economic development, there's been a great, um, uh, all the departments in the township have been very good. Uh, everybody's trying to help get us more factories and more jobs and all that sort of stuff. So I just kind of keep that in mind so that this stuff can get expedited fairly quickly. So somebody can start building in a, in a short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we participate, um, uh, so my, my, my small group participates actually um, in, in center specifically on, on the, on 
Um, so, so we're definitely in touch with, uh, with Pat and with the economic development staff. Um, yeah. When, when okay. there's new Anyhow, just a, it's just a consideration. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, John. Um, any other questions or anything that wasn't clear for you in, in Kyle or Martin's presentation about about the um, proposed policies? I, um, I'd like to weigh in a little bit there because I think Don brings up a, an excellent point. It's a, it's a pretty good segue to some comments uh, I had. Um, uh, I've spoken before about um, the need, I, th I think the need for using the models. I'm very happy to see the policies there, um, what I call sort of means policies as opposed to ends policies. <laughs> you know, how, how to get how to get to finding out what the what quality ends policies are through the means. And I'm really happy to see the ones there for support for the modeling and continued monitoring and so forth. Um, to make sure that uh, demand doesn't run away from supply as we think about growth and development in this community, it, it would seem to be important to undertake those scenario trade-off analyses in you know, you know, reasonably short order for the reasons Don's pointed out, you know, that there will be pressure for economic development and so forth. And we'd want to make sure that's balanced, you know, that demand for water is balanced against the township's ability, I, I suppose, to supply it, right? So, I guess my question then comes comes down to the timing here. As, assuming that these policies are accepted at the Source Protection Committee and so forth and, and everything looks good, we're looking at, is it April, end of April 2021, they leave sort of your shop and go to the ministry for approval. Um, and then there's a time period when they'd have to get approved. Now the county, I, I'm thinking more about the county growth, population growth figures more than the economic development, let's say on the industrial side or something per se, like Don was talking about. Those growth figures, uh, and, and so the county official plan is due sometime later in 2021. I forget the date right now. It, it, if 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 everything worked out well, is that still is that a window that's sort of long enough for the analysts to uh, do a good job on these scenario and trade off analyses about at at what rates uh, we can afford to bring on more development, which would seem to me to be governed by the rate at which we can afford to bring on more water infrastructure. Um, to, to, to the point where it's, of course, limited by the absolute water supply. Um, is that, um, am I making myself understood with that question? We've got it. There's a window of time between April and, and then when the county official plan comes out and presumably new growth targets and so forth, which I, I think, and I, I see in the policies are going to be informed you know, we're going to have the environment horse ahead of the development cart, if if, we, if I understand those policies right. Um, and that's huge. I mean, that's that's very important. Um, and I just wonder about that window of time there, and if that, if, are you optimistic that, that, I, that the resources will be forthcoming to get that kind of analysis piece done in that window to inform the county official plan? Okay. Um, I've, un that one. I've unmuted to, to speak to that and um, Martin and um, Kyle can jump in as they wish. Um, so the, um, the official plan review is, is continuing and um, we, have, we, we do have a deadline, you're correct. Um, technically the deadline is July of 2022. To oh, 22, okay. However, um, <laughs> okay, so it's not that big an increase in the window. No, okay. <laughs> no actually, I, what, what I should say, though, is um, we've had recent conversations with the province and um, because of the or the uh, provincial election cycle, uh, oh, yeah. they're, they're asking for us to have our uh, completed amendment to them in December of 2021. Or January uh, at the latest, so there there is a timing issue there, which is which is tougher than yeah. it looked like before. 
It is. It, yeah. So I, I learned that on the first day of my vacation, and I have to say I was quite quite troubled by that news. <laughs> Good way to ruin um, a vacation. Yeah. It did a little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. Well. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're. I, I'm working with with the province on on our work plan, and we'll be circling back uh, probably within another three weeks or so. Um, but th so the province approved the new um, the new forecast to 2051 on August 28th. Oh. Was amendment one to the 2019 growth plan. They published a consolidation, um, which is effective as of the 28th. So they've already allocated growth to all of the um, upper tier and single tier municipalities in the growth plan area. And, they, and they're um, now considered um, minimums. In the past, they were considered uh, maximums. And um, they're, they're, um, the question of that deadline has, has been out there. And I know that there are some, some municipalities that requested extensions and um, we, we asked for some consideration of extending parts of, of the review and the, the province is not interested in extending the, time, the time frame. So, so in, in my own words then, not, notwithstanding the sort of strength of these policy recommendations that you're, these draft policies you put forward about um, guiding uh, growth and development through, uh, you know, with water sustainability first or, or a top consideration anyway, um, the horse has already left the stable, has it? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that it's something that, that we need to look at together in more detail uh, okay. with the folks that are, that are here today. Um, right, okay. But, but I understand um, the concern that you're raising and it, it, it is, um, you, know, we're, we're, you know, here we're looking at um, putting policies in place to direct the, um, the work of the official plan review, which is already underway. And, and so it, it, that, that does create a challenge. Um, sure. I, I have a few ideas um, for how we might how we might manage things that I'll, I'll be presenting to the province. Um, what, what we're looking at now, um, and sorry for going on so long. No, um, please. It, you know, the, this process is called the, a municipal comprehensive review. And originally in our work plan, um, our plan was to do one amendment to the official plan to cover a, a huge number of items. But we're now, um, the province has agreed that we can um, split into separate amendments. And um, so that might give us some flexibility and the ability to um, have things going concurrently, but not necessarily at the same time. So we can uh, okay. get in when we're ready. Um, mm -hmm. um, it, it just, it, it just, I was a little. I have to. I have to uh, say that I'm, I guess I'm a little disappointed to hear that news. You know, coming on the tail of reading these very strong policies, um, mm -hmm. to hear that they're almost. I won't subvert. It's too strong a word, I suppose, but um, seem to be a, li a little undermined, or you know, wouldn't, wouldn't apply until the the next cycle of official planning or something. Uh, you know, another what is it? Four years. Uh, five five years down the road or something um, where where we would actually be able to put the environmental um, aspects uh, uh, you know con constrain the growth and development in some kind of a but but with some kind of a trade-off analysis uh, which which may indicate we don't have necessarily have to constrain it but I think we're kind of operating in a bit of an information vacuum here about what the sweet spot is and 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 how and how and how it would grow. Uh, and how it would change over time and, and make those forward projections. But uh, yeah, okay, I've taken up too much time. So, sorry, thanks a lot. No, I think that's okay, Tom. Thank you for that. And thanks, Sarah, for 
for um, providing your insights um, and how, how it links together. Um, I'm going to ask anybody else who hasn't had a chance, uh, Jim, yeah. I'd like to quickly ask a similar question in a way, and that is about uh, um, surprised at recharge rates not being considered in the policies because that directly relates to the question Tom was just asking. And uh, even in the tier three report, it, I think the result was that in 2036, which is a lot sooner than 2051, uh, the um, water demands will be within 10% of the, uh, so the recharge rates that they calculated. So it seems to me there's a very crucial factor here that uh, uh, involves recharge rates. And uh, I'm, I would suggest that there definitely needs to be some consideration in the policies to review the recharge rates as we look forward. Uh, it's fine to say we're gonna have more development, but if we run out of water, uh, that's not gonna work too well for anybody. Uh, and all of our talk now, going forward to 2051, uh, uh, I don't expect that I'll see it, but you young folks might have to think about <laughs> whether you're gonna have enough water uh, to drink when you've uh, promised to water all kinds of developments. Uh, so I think that's something that needs to be brought into considerations. Okay, um, Martin or Kyle, any Anything with that? I can start, Kyle. Um, just uh, thanks, Jim, for the for the question. Um, my understanding from the technical studies is that uh, uh, recharge, like the, the amount of water recharging from the ground into the deeper aquifers where the uh, the municipality, like Santa Monica, takes their water from, is really uh, a, a smaller portion. Like the recharge um, is not driving the amount of water that is available for for pumping out so and that kind of insight i think to, as we 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 presented and as as we got we, we learned through the technical studies that kind of translated into that we didn't uh put um a lot of focus on uh recharge so essentially in other words um from what we understand is there could be quite a number of developments happening in and around uh, Alora and Fergus in, in lands already slated for development and in further uh, areas as well. And from what we learned through the modeling and through the technical studies, there would be little impact on the water available in the, in, in the municipal wells, in currently as well as in, in, in you know, new wells. Um, so that's kind of where we, where we started. I mean, obviously those things will have to be reassessed um, and will be looked at again, you know, through, as we mentioned, this adaptive management and, you know, re -look, looking at things down the road again. But that's the current understanding that we don't need to, to safeguard the, the supply. We don't necessarily need to look at uh, the development, the, 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 the paving of the, of the landscape as much as in other areas. And just, and just to add to that, um, so that, that was the technical results. However, we still have policies that address recharge and, and reduction of recharge rates. So that's the, the all of the policies under um, uh, Activity 20. So that includes the environmental compliance approval policies. Um, but I also wanted to kind of draw your attention to actually the planning policies. So there are uh, one, one in regards to C, 20C, which talks about um, expansion of settlement areas, um, and looking at the recharge functions being maintained or improved on lands designated significant groundwater recharge areas. And then D and E are the, are the two planning policies for actual applications within the WOPQ. So there's D is uh, sort of the, the broad brush um, best management practice one, and E is actually specifically for major development. So that, whether that's new residential, commercial, industrial, or institutional, there's a definition of major development. To provide a water balance assessment, to maintain pre-development recharge rates uh, where they can't, uh, to look at implementing and maximizing offsite recharge enhancements, 
balancing with water quality uh, concerns uh, related to things like uh, to, to related to winter maintenance. So, so there are actual policies, just despite Martin's point about the technical work not uh, not and, and my points in the presentation not uh, identifying recharge as a big driver of the risk. We still are actually putting in place, despite that, we still are putting in policies uh, to protect uh, recharge and to, to build on that. And there's uh, A through A through G are policies uh, associated with recharge reduction. Okay. Um, further to that, though, um, the question really, <clears throat> in spite of all the, the things you might do on uh, recharge, the question really is the balance between recharge and demand. And again, I'd say in the uh, tier three results, um, I think there's concern, uh, the general conclusion is okay, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, there are many things that are okay now, but that number 2036, that year, is definitely in the report and is in their study showing that this is when we get within 10% of recharge. And I don't think you're talking about improving recharge rates. You're trying to save the recharge rates to be what they are now. And, uh, and that's good. But at some point, you're going to start having a demand higher than your recharge rates. And that you can argue about whether that's in what level of water your or aquifers you're getting that from. But if your recharge rates at the upper level are falling behind your demand, then you are going to be in big, big trouble uh, in your aquifer. And that's the balance I think that should be reflected somewhere in the policies. Uh, but, can I, so, sorry to interrupt, can I, can I just ask, maybe we need to, to clarify a little bit, I'm not sure whether Sonia can can help us when you say that at in 2036 or 31 we're going to like the recharge rates will surpass the demand is that what you said um if you uh yes i guess i'm not muted uh yes yeah i'm saying in 2036 that's what the results say we will be within 10 percent we're not exceeding but we're getting close, and that's for average demand. It's not allowing for any of the extra demands for whatever else happens with wells being offline, et cetera, et cetera. It's the average demand in 2036 comes at a point where that's 10%, just 10%. That's my, my concern that I think uh, people should be looking at. Comes within 10% of... Um, what our demand is. So our reach, our demand is within 10% uh, of recharge. So we still have recharge up until that time. So you could say, and, and I could say for sure, that's, a, that's good. We get lots of water till 2036 and then we still have a 10% margin. But I'm just saying that a 10% margin in 2036 is not much. And we're supposed to, what is it now? Double again by 2051? That's the official plan. Uh, I don't know if I'm jumping gun here, Sarah, but I think that's the plan is we're supposed to double our uh, demands from 2041 to 51. That's roughly what it works out to. Uh, and do we have sufficient recharge? We're just going to be drawing on our water wells, <laughs> literally. So that's, that's the question. Okay. So I think it's just consideration of the balance of, of um, demand and recharge, knowing where the recharge rates are going. Yes, and, yes, and uh, I think there should be something in the policy statements that says this will be examined. No, th thanks, thanks, Jim. I think uh, no, that's uh, that helps uh, clarify kind of your point. So yeah, definitely we'll we'll take that back and look forward to any written comments that you provide and and uh, and see what we can do. Sure. I can't let this opportunity 
uh, pass, sorry, without pointing out that here would be another opportunity for the sort of scenario analysis I keep championing because then there's a difference between accommodating between absolute growth and, and density, right? And uh, the, the same number of people in per capita water consumption um, it, uh, can, if they're accommodated through densification policies and, and those sorts of things on the growth file, that's different than spreading out that same absolute number of people and, and paving things and, you know, Jim's kind of concerns about recharge rates, Not, notwithstanding that relative to the absolute water consumption, the recharge uh, effects are small. Um, but presumably packing more people into the urban cores and densification and those things can can accommodate some of that growth without without negatively affecting the recharge but but that's that's my point about these trade-off analyses right you can toggle a whole bunch of different switches in these scenario analyses right you can pull different policy levers and 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 look at the relative impact so you know it's similar in style to what you to what you've done so far so anyway okay yeah, thanks, Tom. thanks tom and Jim, um, okay, I'm going to uh, ask any others, anybody else who hasn't had a chance yet? Jim, are you? Yep. Well, I, I, I completely agree with, with Tom about the, the growth issue. Um, it just seems logical that if we have a, a water supply problem, that our water supply is at risk, then the way you, you deal with it is with the, with the demand. And that and that is growth. Um, I, it, this is a, this is a really interesting topic, and I don't want to you know change everything too dramatically. But I just had a small comment that I wanted to make about um, Kyle had mentioned the the monitoring and groundwater and surface water monitoring program, mm -hmm. and that that data would be available for conservation authorities and the province and municipalities. And I, was, um, I would like to suggest that that data should be available to the public also in the spirit of the province's new groundwater management framework when they're talking about a database that um, would be available online for anyone to use, um, you know, for um, Indigenous people and, and residents or um, students uh, studying fish or whatever, um, because I think it's, it's really important. I, Part of what Matrix did for um, the work they did for the water supply master plan was to determine how much discharge would be reduced to wetlands. And there's two wetland complexes, the Salem wetland complex and the Irvine Creek wetland complex that were going to have discharge reduced by up to 12 to 13 percent. And that and that's considerable. So I think that having this surface monitoring is really important and that it should be available to everyone, not just to um, the province and the conservation authorities. So that's a whole different topic. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Jan. Thank okay. okay, any others? Anybody else, questions or comments? So we had provincial prescribed. Dave, are you unmuting, maybe? <laughs> Oh. There you okay. go. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask Kyle if um, the uh, zoning, the zoning um, on the Middlebrook property was um, appears on the uh, urban map for uh, for Center Wellington, and um, there was some. Uh, discussion about uh, who actually controlled the zoning on the property and uh, you had said that the county does which is fine but in uh, in that uh, zoning as a an industrial um, land use uh, the um, dry industrial use wording would, would be applied to it now in the future prohibition part of the um, um, situation that the, the that the new writing of policies is going to, to take into effect. The um, prohibition on that land right now is is pretty distinct. Is that going to stay that way under the uh, under the future um, um, rather restrictive use of that prohibition um, statement or policy? Do, do you follow what I'm asking? 
Sorry, I'm, I'm on mute. Um, just to clarify then, uh, when, you're, when you're terming something prohibition, you're, you're terming it prohibition in terms of the definition of dry industrial use in the rural employment zone? Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm saying that that use pretty well prohibits um, uh, water taking, a water bottling okay. operation. But I'm, okay. what I'm asking is, is that prohibition uh, uh, from the county uh, going to be altered by the prohibition approach that the province is taking here as a last resort? Well, so I guess I'm, I, I'd like to clarify something. So when, when we talked, uh, when I've talked previously about this, um, the zoning is actually controlled by the township. And I'll let Sarah jump in when uh, when uh, if, I if thought it was be. I thought you said it was controlled by the let, county. Let me let me if I do let me, allow me to finish. Um, okay. So the rural employment land uh, is defined under the county official plan. Um, so that is county, and um, but you and that's and it's, I let I'll let Sarah jump in on the proper term. But that's what's defined in the uh, that land use uh, category is defined in the county OP but the actual zone is in the zoning bylaw. But the, so what we're talking about here is I don't think actually necessarily the zoning, it's the rural employment land definition, which is in the county official plan. Sarah, is that, is that, am I explaining that correctly? So Dave, I think we are talking, like we're talking about the rural employment land definition and that is in the county OP, that is in the county official plan. That's yes. not in the township zoning bylaw. Right. Okay, so that's- well, that's, a, that's a land use designation, it's not a zone. Okay, so I just so wanted to clarify. Land use, okay. it's land use. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to clarify that. Now, your question, and thank you, sir. Your question was about the prohibition. Um, well, just the use approach. of it. Yeah, so the, the tier three policies, I guess they don't speak specifically to that. Uh, we don't, we, at this point, we don't speak specifically to um, your, your, your question about the rural employment land use. Um, so, and I don't know if I feel comfortable actually answering in terms of what may or may not be in the township zoning bylaw, because that's definitely outside of kind of my area. And, and Brett was unfortunately unable to, to join us. So maybe what we can do, Dave, is take this question back um, and get, uh, get, a, a, get a reply from, uh, in conjunction with Brett Salmon uh, on it, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. thanks, Clarence. All right. Okay. We'll deal with it later. Fine. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to see if there's anybody else who has any questions or, or comments. Uh, Susan, it's Janet Harrop here. Hi, Janet. Hi. I have to turn my video off with real internet or I can't hear anybody. So, no um, <laughs> so I'm part of this group uh, representing the Wellington Federation of Agriculture. So my agricultural voice, um, and to kind of build on something that Jim had um, made a comment to earlier is about the, uh, the recharge. And um, just following along with some of the modeling and, and looking at the deep aquifers that the municipality taps into, but some of the leakage that may happen around some of the casements and some of the wells, how is um, some of the impact of um, the decrease in recharge as well as some of this leakage going to be measured um, outside of the urban boundary because unfortunately that hasn't been included in this um, study to see the impact on on uh, private wells in particular agricultural um, businesses that have livestock so when like we've actually even the, in the last couple of years had to drop our um, submersible well deeper in our well to get the same flow that we got a few years ago so we're already seeing impact so we're I'm just wondering um, with um, increase urban use and recognizing that that will be addressed with um, proper deeper aquifer municipal wells. But how is the monitoring of leakage along casements um, through aquitards and potentially um, uh, decrease in the flow of some of the more, more um, uh, superficial um, water that uh, private wells are going to be um, tapping into? How is that going to be monitored? Okay, great. Thanks, Janet. Kyle or I'll, Martin? Uh, 
yeah, I'll, I'll start on it and then let Martin or Sonia jump in if, uh, if, they, if they wish. So from the municipal uh, point of view, you're, you're correct. The, the main municipal monitoring pro, um, network is predominantly in the urban area because it is surrounding the, uh, the municipal wells. Um, so, but as part of our network, it's, we don't just monitor mon uh, the municipal wells. We also monitor private wells if they, if they are uh, in close proximity. And we also monitor and install observation wells, uh, multi-level, uh, often multi-level, so multi-aquifer observation wells. Um, as you know, um, there's the, uh, an expansion program. Uh, there's the Watchdog Master Plan has identified some new uh, well locations. Um, so there will be a Class EA process that, that'll have to be undertaken uh, to uh, site those new wells. And as part of that program, there would be that that's naturally going to be out of the urban area uh, and more. The, I think the areas that were identified by ACOM tend to be more in the immediate rural area around surrounding the surrounding Fergus and Aurora. So there would be monitoring associated with that. Um, that could include, uh, I, I can't be specific, but, I, but could include private well monitoring, could include installation of observation wells, could include um, surface water monitoring, um, you know, th things of that nature. So that's the, on the municipal side, um, there's also monitoring that, that occurs on programs that occur with the GRCA uh, uh, conduct. Um, and, uh, and I can let uh, Martin or Sonia speak, uh, speak more to that um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of kind of more baseline environmental monitoring. Um, okay, thanks, Martin. <laughs> yeah, I can just add add that. Um, I mean, and Kyle spoke to the to one of the policies that that uh, it is already in the like is being proposed with regards to monitoring, and that uh, there will be essentially uh, collaboration between the different agencies, whether it's you know, it's the municipality, it's conservation authority. Also, we don't obviously like to bring the, the province in uh, to to figure out what kind of monitoring is needed to address some of those uh, some of those uh, issues, and and basically to get better data. Uh, for the next round of of modeling to 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 look at those things, N none of those none of those uh, areas have been um, kind of explored in detail to figure out exactly what what the, that monitoring will look like. Uh, we're in a very different situation right now with uh, you know right now with the pandemic and everything else, and financially, every you know municipalities, the province, conservation authorities. So we'll really have to look what that will look like. But that the aim is, and the policy speaks to. Uh, that there will be a collaborative effort uh, to look at uh, the monitoring uh, monitoring program uh, longer term um, to look at uh, both surface water groundwater the interactions um, to to figure out how we can how we can address and, and get better and improved information um, it's just it's yes we, we all wish to to have better information it's it's obviously the challenge is who's going to do the work and who's going to pay for it and it's uh, it's in you know quite challenging times for for getting some of those things uh, off the ground but uh, certainly the the policy speaks to that this is this will be a will be a focus great thanks martin um anybody else um chris anything for you No, not really. Just uh, very interesting, but I don't really have any questions. Okay. And Jeremy, questions, feedback? I'm, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to absorb all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if I have any questions or comments, I'll submit something in writing. But uh, I had a very good conversation with Kyle this afternoon, which I think was more to do with uh, the quality risks and salt management. And those are things that I, that I know in, in terms of the HALOC property that, you know, we'll have to look very closely at how to deal with those uh, concerns about salt entering into the groundwater. But I realized that tonight's discussion is more to do with quantity and I think in terms of the HALOC site, we've done, I think, everything that we can do given the conditions to promote um, recharge through a groundwater management system that is a fairly uh, simple yet at the same time a somewhat 
uh, I, I won't call it elaborate, but there's an element of um, kind of a new system that will be eventually monitored, or I should say assumed by the municipality that's in effect a second type of storm sewer system in that groundwater is being collected and recharged in a defined part of the site. And, um, you know, the soil conditions necessitate that. So we've done a lot of work to produce a, an engineering design to accomplish the goal of recharge. And it may be a model for other parts of Center Wellington uh, if the soils were more porous, we could be doing things at source instead of kind of at the end of a pipe. But I think that those are examples of what the development industry needs to do and wants to do and wants to implement. And um, it would be interesting to know if the policies that are being developed will have something to do with monitoring that system. I'm not aware of that at this point, but I think maybe Kyle, you and I, could have another conversation about that, maybe with the municipality. Yeah, certainly, Jeremy. Um, actually, and the policies do. So um, 20A and 20B uh, specifically talk with environmental compliance approvals uh, that would be required for that system uh, and specifically talk about monitoring uh, conditions being uh, being added or cons being the ministry considering adding them. Uh, so that would be how that monitoring goes from the ministry's perspective. Um, and then certainly that doesn't... Uh, that, that doesn't preclude any additional monitoring that could be done, um, you know, also with, uh, uh, that could be done as well. So. Great, thanks Kyle. Um, Jan, did you have your hand up? Did you have something else? I just wanted to, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Susan. I just wanted to add to what Janet Harp was asking about the private wells and the agricultural wells that, that um, right now all of our wells are within the urban boundary, but from now on, our wells are going to have to be outside, in, in an outer ring, uh, several kilometers away from the urban boundary. And so um, in the future, our, our wells may affect agricultural and private wells in, in rural areas more than they are even now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, and that's a, that's a fair point, uh, Jan and, and Janet, for sure. Um, in terms of uh, the Tier 3 study, the, I think the conclusion about um, the impact or potential uh, impact of livestock operations to municipal systems was based on existing systems, uh, for sure, and existing wells. Uh, so that, that would be an analysis that could be uh, uh, redone um, in the future when, uh, when the well network changes, uh, which obviously then puts the, well, the municipal well network closer to, to some of those livestock operations, uh, or if there's new operations uh, coming online. Great, thanks Kyle. Um, I'm just conscious of our time. Are there, is there any other last questions, feedback? Susan, can I just ask one more quick question? Of course. Um, it's Janet again. So the uh, region of Waterloo has, um, for many years, has um, dug monitoring wells and made that a uh, priority to be able to um, monitor obviously their water so um, we are we do have some monitoring wells but not very many in this area so is how do we make that a priority and at what level so if it's left up to each municipality it, it, it's more at a regional level that they do it in Waterloo so would this be a county initiative is it more provincial initiative like how do we all work together to be able to get more monitoring wells that are are not only in just in the urban area but also outside because I, I know I, we had a discussion at the Federation of Agriculture about possibly providing access to some of our private wells in the rural areas to be used from a monitoring perspective but it, it presents a risk a significant risk to the producers from the monitoring equipment and the water sampling and um, a potential it, it, it yeah, and with the use of these wells and the water that is taken from these wells at different times of the day, it doesn't really give you the valuable information that you need. So how do we move the monitoring piece forward just because there's, it's such a, a large cost component? So I don't know who could answer that. I can, I can start, Janet. Janet and uh, yeah, it's, it's a combination. It's uh, and absolutely, I think you, you hit the, 
the challenge, uh, or the, the nail on the head about the challenge. Um, I see it as um, it's kind of multifaceted. Uh, so the municipality has a role to play for sure. Uh, and, that, and we talked a bit about that in terms of new monitoring wells uh, that will be needed um, uh, as new municipal wells come online. Uh, so that could be part of the Class EA process. And then once uh, those are installed, they become part of the monitoring network going forward. Um, but then also the Conservation Authority and even the province. We, we didn't speak to this earlier, but the province does maintain a provincial groundwater monitoring network. Um, there's not many of those wells in this area, uh, however. Um, so I think, I think it can be addressed at multiple levels. Uh, so certainly the municipality has, has a large role to play, and you're absolutely right, the region is, has sort of led led that charge um and um in terms of in terms of um the legal requirement i suppose uh it does rest here it is and this is where we are different than the region uh, it does rest here on the lower tier municipalities so it does rest on the center wellingtons the mapletons the errands um because we are the we are the municipalities responsible for water supply and water treatment um, not not at the county level, uh, so that is the one the, that is a difference uh, between the region model that that you're uh, mentioning. But yeah, I think it is at multi and that and, and I think it, I think it can be at multiple levels. Um, but there is budget constraints, as as Martin pointed out, uh, for sure. And partnerships uh, with private landowners is very helpful for sure. Um, however, I absolutely recognize the concerns that you just uh, brought up. Um, there's a risk reward there for sure, uh, both private uh, landowners uh, allowing monitoring on, on their own uh, production wells. So I, sorry, just to finish up, I guess the, the, I, the just to kind of finish maybe on a more, uh, um, is with the policy that we wrote about information sharing and about monitoring, that, that's really what we're trying to get at with those two policies is working together with the different agencies, working together with landowners, uh, and trying to be creative to come up with ways to get these wells in the ground and get these wells monitored. Um, it, it is expensive, um, but it's definitely uh, definitely worth it. And uh, the data is data is important to uh, be able to drive the decision. Okay, great. Uh, can Thank I you. ask a, a quick question? After all, the uh, um, I guess Frank Brunton at the Ontario Geological Survey would want to know whether his wells have been uh, taken up by anybody. I know he was looking for somebody to take possession of the OGS wells. Does anybody have any? Uh, hi, Chris. I think you're talking about the one that was uh, drilled near, near Middlebrook? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've been in discussion a little bit with uh, Elizabeth Freep about it. Um, but uh, just with, with everything that's happened with the pandemic, it, it uh, you know, it hasn't continued on. Okay. Um, and I know too, that was something, um, I believe the OGS was planning on discussing with the township as well. Um, just because that is an important well. Um, yeah. I think everyone yeah. wants to see that, see that well continued on with monitoring. Thank you. Actually, sorry, Susan, I, I know just time, but just, um, there has been discussions as well uh, with the township and um, uh, University of Guelph and universities as well. So there is, there is uh, with the University of Guelph uh, and universities. So there is work that's being done um, in the area uh, through, uh, through, I believe, Ben Sarkar. Well, your France. sound's cutting out. Oh, okay. How's that? Better. Okay, sorry. Uh, all I was going to say is that township has been in discussions in the past and um, and, and continues to be with, with the universities as well. There is re university research that's happening in the area too in terms of monitoring. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I'm just checking our time. We're coming up to 8.30, so I think we'll, we'll leave it there and I'll ask Martin to share sort of next steps and timelines. So Martin, are you able to share your screen? There we go. And unmute. I think I'm almost done here. Yeah, we're just gonna have to 
get this over here. There we go. Okay, can you see that all? Um, so just um, a couple of slides, three slides to, to finish off tonight. Um, so I'd like to kind of just remind ourselves of the next steps um, in terms of the timeline of what's going to happen uh, with the, the kind of closing off the, the community liaison group process. Uh, we're continuing with the section 34 plan update. Um, so the next uh, item is going to be that we're bringing uh, revised policies to the October 1 Source Protection Committee. Uh, that's going to be the, the most uh, mo the recent one. And then we're going to uh, head into what we call a pre-consultation. So that's an opportunity for municipalities and the ministries to provide us their comments. Uh, any comments from this group will be addressed uh, uh, at the same time in, 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 um, in the same period. And then in the, in the, the next, uh, the next uh, committee meeting, which is going to be early January, uh, no, it's not that early, but in January 25, I guess, uh, we'll bring all those comments and how they will be addressed back to the back to the committee. After that, there'll be a, a formal public consultation process, and it's going to be an opportunity for uh, everyone, including obviously CLG members, stakeholders, to provide additional comments um, as part of that um, uh, period, that that uh, consultation period. We'll go back to. Um, back to the committee in early spring. It's going to be an April uh, committee meeting. And then um, with the process seems to go through the authority and then finally by, by uh, kind of early May, hopefully we'll be able to submit an updated uh, plan to the province. So that's kind of the next steps uh, with respect to uh, that. As Kyle was saying, it's kind of a bureaucratic process, but it's what we need to go through to have those plan updates uh, put in place. Uh, to have that happen, and specifically in the, in the immediate future here, we'd like you to uh, provide us your comments by September 16. Uh, if you need a couple of three days more, that's, that's fine. Um, after September 23, we'll have a, well, we won't be able to provide the, those, uh, those comments to the, uh, to the Source Protection Committee. Uh, within a week, we'll be providing uh, everyone with a draft meeting summary, and you'll have then two weeks to uh, respond to to the to any comments on the meeting summary from tonight um, and obviously that the finalized summary and any comments and everything the, all the material will be posted on the website uh, together with it, all the other information that is there as I mentioned so policy development continues it's now just another process uh, committee meeting next uh, uh, on October the 1 is the first step and there'll be few other opportunities for you to have input into, into that process. So the, the process certainly hasn't, hasn't stopped with tonight. Um, and finally, I'd like to uh, kind of already conclude the evening with a big thank you um, to, to, to you as the, as the members of the community uh, liaison group. Um, so we, we've been working together for those four years. Uh, we'd like to thank you for your time, for your effort, and for all your thoughtful comments and all the review uh, over those, those those past four years. So we've really had, uh, hopefully, um, had an opportunity to be able to provide information to you, um, to, to provide uh, you an opportunity to, to uh, provide you, us with your questions, your comments. I'm obviously looking forward to your comments from tonight. I uh, really appreciate uh, the dedication to, to, to your community and, and all the, uh, the, the kind of theme that we're obviously talking about here, the, our water. And we really think we've been able to together um, make it this process better by having uh, this process with the community liaison group. So thank you very much to uh, everyone. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm going to stop sharing my my screen because we out of the we're out of slides. Uh, thank thankfully we're at the end of the end of the meeting. And so thank you very much for everyone uh, for their participation and. and